Good afternoon. Welcome to this meeting of the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Siting, and Maritime Uses. I'm Councilmember Adrian Adams, the Chair of this Subcommittee, and we are joined today by Councilmember Barron, and we are expecting other Council Members to come in very shortly. Today we will hold a public hearing on the 202-207 7th Avenue project and a vote on the applications related to the 784 Cortland Avenue project. The 201 through 207 7th Avenue project consists of two applications submitted by the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development, both of which we are hearing pre-considered to facilitate a mixed-use development containing approximately 26 affordable residential units and commu commercial space in the Speaker's District in Manhattan. Application number C, 190-253-HAM requests the designation of an urban development action area for property located at 201-207 7th Avenue, block 797, lots 80, 81, 82, and 83, and an urban development action area project for such area pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law and pursuant to Section 197-C of the New York City Charter, approval of the disposition of such property to a developer selected by HPD. Application number 201957-31HAM, submitted by HPD pursuant to Section 577 of Article uh, Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law requests approval of a real property tax exemption for such property. And I do have remarks submitted by Speaker Ch Corey Johnson. Which read, since taking office in 2014, Getting this project jump-started has been one of my top priorities. After many years of inaction and false starts, I am happy that the city is finally moving to forward with an affordable housing redevelopment plan for the city-owned properties at West 22nd Street and 7th Avenue. These buildings have languished for far too long, but we have a great team in place who will be delivering sorely needed affordable housing for this community. For me, it is important that the tenants who have lived in these buildings will be able to buy into their apartment for $2,500 under the Tenant Interim Lease Program and that all displaced families will have an opportunity to return whether they rent or buy. It is also important that we work together to make sure these units are permanently affordable and that owners are not incentivized to sell by receiving windfall profits. We will have questions following. Uh, we're going ahead and introduce the panel. We've been joined by Council Member Traeger. And we are going to have our vote before we hear from HPD. We will now vote on LUs 467 and LU 468, both submitted by the Department of Housing Preservation and Development regarding the 784 Cortland Avenue project in Chair Salamanca's district in the Bronx. LU 467 is an application pursuant to Section 505 of Article 15 of the General Municipal Law of New York State and Section 197-C of the New York City Charter for the Fourth Amendment to the Melrose Commons urban renewal plan for the Melrose Commons urban renewal area. The amendment would remove a 45-foot height restriction from Site 15 imposed by the current urban renewal plan for certain buildings in R7-2 and R7-A districts. LU-468 is an application submitted pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law for approval of an urban development action area designation for the property located at 359 East 157th Street and 784 Cortland Avenue, Block 2404, Lots 1 and 2, and the approval of an urban development action area project for such area pursuant to 197-C of the New York City Charter for the disposition of such property to a developer selected by HPD. The related applicants would exempt the development site from a height limit in order to facilitate the construction of a seven-story mixed-use building with approximately 20 residential units, all of which will be affordable, ground floor retail space and community facility space. I will now call for a vote to approve LUs 467 and 468. Council, please call the roll. Adams. I vote aye. Barron. I vote aye. Traeger. 
Aye. By a vote of three in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and with zero abstentions, the items are approved for forwarding to the full land use committee, for forwarding to the full land use committee, and the vote is held open. Thank you. As stated, the vote will be held open. We'll now hear testimony from uh, Christine Redcalf, Redclaff, thank you, Genevieve M Michelle, Andrea Alexa Poulos. You may begin. The pre-considered land use actions before the subcommittee today are related to the development of a project known as 201-207 7th Avenue in Manhattan District 3. The item related to C190253HAM consists of the proposed ULARP actions that seek urban development action. Okay, area. we're going to stop you really quickly so that council can swear you. Hi, in. Yes. I'm sorry. Please raise your right hands. Please state your names. Genevieve Michael. Christine. Christine Ratzlaff O'Connell. Andrea Alexopoulos. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and an answer to all uh, council member questions? Yes. 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 Okay, please continue. Uh, in disposition of city-owned property for a development site consisting of four city-owned multiple dwellings, the zoning district is R8AC2-59 with an FAR of 6, the lot area of 3,700 square feet, and a total developable area of 22,000 square feet. Additionally, the item related to C20195731HAM consists of an Article 11 tax exemption request for a term of 40 years. Located at Block 797, lots 80, 81, 82 and 83 in Manhattan, Council District 3. The project is slated for redevelopment under HPD's Affordable Neighborhood Cooperative Program, or ANCP. The site is comprised of four contiguous city-owned buildings containing 14 units on the corner of 7th Avenue and 22nd Street. As part of the ANCP program guidelines, city-owned multiple dwellings are conveyed to restoring communities HDFC for $1 per tax lot and then rehabilitated by private developers selected through a competitive process to create affordable cooperatives for low and moderate income households. The developer will sign a site development and management agreement with restoring communities that will be in effect until co-op conversion occurs and title transfers from restoring communities HDFC to a tenant formed HDFC cooperative. From the time of the cooperative conversion, the developer will remain the property manager for at least one year. After the first year, the co-op will have the choice of keeping the developer as property manager or hire a new company as approved by HPD. The four buildings in the 7th Avenue cluster were taken into city ownership through an in-rem foreclosure action in 1976, and in November 1997, the existing tenants entered into the Tenant Interim Lease Program. As a requirement of the TIL program, tenants formed tenant associations to manage their buildings and collect rents under a net lease from the City of New York until such time as the tenants have met all the milestones and are ready for next steps. Generally, buildings in ANCP undergo substantial rehabilitation. However, in this case, the four buildings will be demolished and replaced by a single multiple dwelling building, thus requiring ULARP. Three of the buildings have been vacated due to structural stability issues, and tenants have been temporarily relocated in nearby neighborhoods. The last remaining uh, tenant in 207 7th Avenue uh, we hope will be temporarily relocated by the end of July 2019. Uh, after the conveyance, construction will be undertaken by the developer who proposes to build a nine-story mixed-use building with ground floor commercial space for which a use has yet to be determined. The residential portion of the project will contain nine studios, ten one-bedrooms, five two-bedrooms, and two three-bedrooms apartments. The residential amenities will include a rooftop terrace, community room, a lobby garden space, bike room, package storage area, and a laundry room. The co-op interest attributable to occupied apartments will be sold to the existing tenants for $2,500. Additionally, the maintenance is anticipated to be approximately 40% of AMI for existing tenants, uh, which is roughly $628 a month for studio, $801 for a one-bedroom, $976 for a two-bedroom, and $1,122 for a three-bedroom unit. The cooperative units attribu interest attributable uh, to vacant apartments will be so sold to a price affordable to families earning no more than 165% of area median income. In order to facilitate development of the project and maintain long-term affordability, HPD seeks approval of these pre-considered items, which includes the Article 11 tax exemption providing for a total benefits of approximately $3,794,206 with a net present value of $1,059,922. Thank you. I'll now turn it over to Afi. Hi, my name is Andrea Alexopoulos. I'm the project manager at Asian Americans for Equality. 
or AFI for short. Uh, AFI is a 45-year-old nonprofit community organization that was founded in the civil rights movement in Chinatown. Our organization was born out of a grassroots group fighting to get local workers access to construction jobs at government development sites, and we've been fighting for equal opportunities and equal rights in New York ever since. Our services span from safety net social services to neighborhood small business support to home ownership counseling to affordable housing rehab and development. AFI is deeply committed to preserving affordable housing throughout New York City and providing new opportunities for our city's diverse communities. Uh, this is a rendering of the future building at the site at 201-207 7th Avenue. I don't know how. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Page down. I don't know how to work this. Um, is it set up as a slideshow or is it? I Thank you. Uh, for this project, AFI has selected Amy Gross Architects to work on this project as the architect of record. Um, they have extensive experience with affordable housing with a focus on community integrated design. Um, some of the amenities were already discussed earlier. The final building will have a rooftop terrace, a community room. All the units will be handicap accessible and ADA compliant. Uh, the building will also be uh, very energy efficient and will achieve enterprise green community standards. Uh, this is a detailed image of the building elevations for the future building. Uh, this is a detail of the ground floor of the proposed building. Um, to the left, you can see the entrance to the residential space along West 22nd Street, um, while the commercial spaces front to 7th Avenue on the bottom of the page. Um, the commercial spaces have been subdivided into three small spaces based on feedback from the community board in order to accommodate smaller local retailers. There's also um, some outdoor space in the rear of the building uh, that is accessible only through the residential corridor at this time. Uh, this is an image of one of the typical floor layouts. Uh, this has a two bedroom apartment on the corner in the orange, one bedrooms in purple, and blue is the studio. Uh, the building will also have two three bedroom units. Uh, so these are the typical layouts for those, those floors with the three bedroom on the corner. And you have the one bedroom above and two studios. Uh, this floor is for the resident amenities on the eighth floor of the building. Uh, there's a laundry room and a recreation room uh, for the tenants where they can have meetings with their co-op. Uh, they can also have a party in there or be able to access the space as they wish. Uh, there's also a shared roof garden for all of the tenants. Uh, the ninth floor of the building has a, has a setback, a, a bit of a tower uh, as required by zoning. So this is a schematic of the ninth floor plan where you have two units up there. Um, and that is the current design as it stands now. So let us know if you have any questions. Thank you very much.
uh, for your testimony today and, and presentation. Um, there are questions. Um, I understand that um, Community Board 4 and the speaker uh, had specific questions on this project. So let's go ahead and talk about some unresolved issues that remain. Uh, is it possible to extend the HPD regulatory agreement for income and resale restrictions? So generally speaking, when we're looking at the length of our regulatory agreement, we focus on the length of the tax exemption just to make sure that we're setting buildings up for success into the future. Um, you know, on this project, the length of the Article 11 is 40 years. That's the longest it can be uh, via state law. But, you know, have certainly heard the request from both the speaker and community board to see if there is any way we can work out a longer term of affordability um, and are, you know, testing out some options internally to try and figure out if there's any path to success there. Okay, so this will be ongoing with the community board and the speaker then. Okay. Can a new 130% AMI income tier be created in addition to the 160% AMI tier for non-returning tenant units? Yeah, so I think... Um, under the ANCP program and certainly in these sorts of HDFCs, we try to make sure that there is one uh, AMI level across the board. I think just to make sure that, uh, you know, tenants are, th there is equity among the tenants. Uh, but I think, you know, again, we are looking at whether or not there is a way to make the project more affordable across the board. Um, I think with all of the history that we talked a little bit about today, and certainly the speaker and the community board are, you know, even more aware of than I am, uh, the financing on this project is really tough. And so I think it's going to be financially difficult for us to bring down those AMIs, but we are giving it our best shot and seeing what is possible. Okay, I'm sure the speaker and the community community board would appreciate that. 160% AMI tier is extreme. Uh, okay, according to the flip tax schedule, after year 15, the seller would be able to get back 80% of the proceeds of the sale, leaving 20% to go back to the co-op. What is this breakdown after 15 years? Post 15 years, um, the 20% remains. So it's uh, from 15 until year 40, 20% of the profit will come back to the co-op. Okay, so restate that again. Sure. So we have a flip tax schedule for all purchasers um, where profit is subject to be split between the seller and the co-op. Um, years one through three, there's a 0% uh, profit recognition from, from any party. Um, and then it increases by 5% uh, from years 4 to 15. At year 15, you sort of max out at your ability to retain profit, and 20% will always go back to the co-op. Um, and that's year 15 is when you max out, and then that goes until the conclusion of the regulatory agreement. Okay, got it. Thank you. Is it possible to establish resale price caps to prevent windfall process, profits for all purchasers? The flip tax schedule is a means to restrict profit over time and incentivize long-term home ownership. Um, it, you know, incentivizes that for every year that you are living in the co-op and that you're essentially waiting, or or you're just you're just living in the co-op because it's your primary residence. Um, you are not uh, you're not getting a windfall. You're you're subject to sharing your profit with the co-op. So the wind tax would be the remedy. The, the flip tax. The flip tax, I'm sorry, would is, be the remedy. Is that remedy, yes. Okay, all right. Is it possible to require that all units be sold back to HDFC for resale? Um, do you want to talk about local? Yeah, I mean, I think our interpretation of Local Law 64 as passed by the council would actually prevent that from happening. Okay. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm going to come back to you. I think Councilmember Barron has some questions. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, these maintenance fees sound like they're close to what it would be for a rental in my community, so they really sound great. 628 for a studio, 801, 801 for one bedroom, 976 for two bedroom, and 1,122 for three bedroom. So I, I commend the community and the speaker for negotiating those maintenance uh, rates. I do have some questions. It was partly the question that was raised uh, by the chair 
talking about creating a new 130 AM income tier in addition to. So I heard you say the 165, well, 160, 165 is what you have established, but can we have another income band in addition to that? So that not all, a certain percentage at that 130 in addition to the 160, 165. So we, in ANCP, we're really setting our income tier based on what it costs to develop a project. This is a particularly expensive site. Um, as Genevieve mentioned, we traditionally do renovations, so new construction is not our bread and butter. Um, but in this case, because of the site conditions, um, we, we have to move towards a new construction. That is particularly costly. There's other, uh, there's other reasons why this is particularly costly, not just that it's new construction, but it's, uh, it is adjacent to the, um, the train line. So there's uh, additional engineering and oversight that's required as part of the development of this project. Um, there's, uh, as part of demolition, this is going to be a brick by brick demolition versus a wrecking ball style demolition. Um, and, and all of that sort of enhances the cost of the project. So when we're looking at what it costs to renovate, we have to look at what it costs to pay back that, uh, that investment. Um, and so the maintenance is part of the repayment of the investment, but also the, the upfront, the sale, the sale prices that we get from selling uh, the occupied and the vacant apartments, that's another way that we're able to uh, sort of pay down or pay off that investment that, that's being made at such a high amount. Um, so that's why our sale prices for the vacant apartments have been set at 160% of area median income. Um, Genevieve also mentioned that uh, in these limited equity co-ops, when we are talking about one unit, one vote, we are, we are very um, cognizant of, of the need to have equity across the uh, across the, the co-op structure. And so setting separate income tiers um, in the co-op so that we can have sort of differentiation instead of, instead of that sort of similar equity is, is a concern for the program. Oh, well, um, I hear what you're saying, but I, I take exception to that. I don't, I don't think that uh, that influences the conditions that you're trying to establish. What's the size of the studio apartment? Uh, 385 square feet. Okay. And in your testimony, you say that um, the co-op interest attributable to, attributable to occupied apartments will be sold to the existing tenants. How many tenants are there? And there you, you talked about one that's still to be relocated, but how many tenants are actually still a part of this uh, plan? We have five families associated with this future co-op. Four of them have been relocated out, and one is, has accepted a relocation unit and is in the process of being relocated out temporarily. So, so there are only five? There's five. So all the rest are going to be new? Eleven, uh, excuse me, 21 units would be, are vacant. So how many units will be uh, constructed? In this? 26 total. 26. So most of them are going to be new. So most of them are going to be sold at that 165% of the AMI. We, we are going to sell units at 150% of area median income. Um, and then we're going to restrict the income uh, of those sale prices to families earning no more than 160% AMI to give us a little marketing band room. Okay. And... Um I had another question. If it comes to me the next two minutes, I'll, I'll ask it then. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, just I remembered. Go right ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I think I remember. Yes. Is there a requirement that the tenants, how long must a tenant or the co-op owner have this as their primary residence? For the duration of the regulatory agreement. So Thank you. when we market. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then, you know, okay. I, According to the flip schedule, if they leave, and, okay, good. Thank yes. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councilmember Barron. Uh, along those same lines, what is the uh, unit size breakdown for the units that will accommodate the five returning tenants? 
There are, out of the five families, two will be relocated into three bedroom, or will be returning to three bedroom apartments, and three will be returning to two bedroom apartments. So essentially they're going back to the same setup that they, okay, great. How will the 21 vacant units be marketed? They'll be marketed through HPD marketing procedures, um, which requires that the developer prepare a plan um, and uh, market publicly, uh, advertise in multiple sources, uh, advertise on HPD website, um, and that they receive applications, randomize those applications. There's only a preference for New York City residents. Um, it's not a community board preference, but it's a preference for New York City residents. Um, and we go down the list after the list is randomized. Those that qualify are the first to purchase. That was going to be another question as far as community board preference is concerned. And, and why is there no community board preference? With this? There are returning tenants to this building, so there is no community preference. Understood. Understood. Okay. Speaking about the community board, can you um, review the feedback that was provided by community board four that's been incorporated in the building design? Or anything else that came from um, CB4 that was incorporated in your decision making? Sure. I would say, first of all, the design itself of the facade was uh, very much a factor of community board input. Um, this neighborhood has a lot of mercantile buildings, um, so there was a lot of feedback about style and um, facade details that were incorporated. Uh, we had many different versions of the facade, so this was... Uh, a late stage design that was meeting their satisfaction. Um, they also wanted the entrance on 22nd Street that was accommodated. Uh, they also wanted this rear yard space not to be accessible from the commercial space because they have concerns about loud restaurants at night. So we had that connecting only through the residential area. They also, as I mentioned before, uh, were very vocal about having smaller retail spaces. Um, they also would like there to be language in the regulatory agreement to not uh, allow chain stores. So that's something that we can look to accommodate as well. Um, they also had, what else? There's a lot of elements. Uh, they, they had us bump out this community, this um, commercial space into the residential lobby a bit. You can see that it's um, the corner kind of juts into the residential lobby. So they wanted to maximize the commercial space for the co-op so that it could maximize its own revenue from uh, the commercial spaces. Anything else? Among other things, that's that's about those are the main ones. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. It looks like there's there's pretty decent representation from CB4 involved. So, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, are there any other questions from my colleagues, Councilmember Traeger? No. Okay. Um, thank you very much. We are. Um, thankful for your testimony today, and you are excused. Thank you. Are there any members of the public who wish to testify on these items? Seeing none, the public hearings on these two pre-considered items are now closed and the items are laid over. Our vote on LU 467 and 468 are also closed. This concludes today's business. I'd like to thank the members of the public, my colleagues, council and land use staff for attending today's hearing. This meeting is hereby adjourned.